I was reading the news stories about the solidarity protests springing up over the past few days in support of the myriad members of the Asian community against violence that is being carried out against them here in the U.S., I've been reminded that the connections between the oppression, violation, and exploitation of people of various Asian countries and that of people of African descent are similar in more ways than many realize, even as there are differences in our existence in this society. But of course, there are always people who say things like, well, why should we support them? They never support us. And I feel like it's important that this fallacy be addressed and laid to rest, because to defeat the system that oppresses and exploits us all and creates this kind of violence, what we need more than anything other than organization is solidarity. Now, last year, many members of various Asian communities marched and protested in solidarity with Black Lives Matter in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. There are formal organizations like Asians for Black Lives that is part of the Asian American Advocacy Fund in Georgia, the Asian American Organizing Project that's a youth focused organization with clear advocacy for Black Lives Matter in Minnesota, and the hashtag Asians for Black Lives page on Tumblr, and a wealth of information connected to that hashtag and history, the history of solidarity with Black activists seeking justice going back to 2014. And there are people and groups who have no organized structure and not associated with any organization joining in community with Black activists to fight for justice across the country as well, which we saw throughout last summer. And yeah, the difficult conversations about how this imperialist system conditions some Asians to believe and accept the model minority stereotype have been a part of their confrontation of this system, as many younger Asians in particular see and reject this indoctrination for the divide and conquer tactic of the capitalist white supremacist ruling class that it is. But if the present actions of our Asian brothers and sisters aren't enough to keep us from abandoning them when they need our support, then history is always the best teacher. Frederick Douglass denounced the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. An Indian immigrant, H.G. Mudgal, was the editor of The Negro World, Marcus Garvey's paper that was published by his Universal Negro Improvement Association in the early 20th century. The Third World Liberation Front in the 60s at UC Berkeley in California brought Asian American, Black, and other ethnic students together to demand equal educational opportunities and an ethnic studies program at the university. Then there was the Polynesian Panther Party formed in Auckland and New Zealand in 1971 to target racial inequalities carried out against indigenous Maori and Pacific Islanders that was explicitly influenced by the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in the United States, and Huey P. Newton in particular. There were lifelong Asian activists like human rights and Black liberation activist Yuri Kochiyama, a victim of U.S.-Japanese internment camps in her youth, who went on to work with Malcolm X, the Young Lords, the Republic of New Africa, and other justice and liberation groups for oppressed and marginalized people. She co-founded Asians for Mumia with Gloria Loom, a Chinese-American activist, which is a collective of Asians and Asian-Americans fighting to free political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal. And this is just a small sampling of the historic connections of the struggle for liberation and justice that Asians and Asian-Americans have supported and joined us in, or that we have connected with them on. So the idea that they have never supported us is born out of the same imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, divide and conquer indoctrination that facilitates all of our oppression in the first place. So we must reject it. As Yuri Kochiyama said, we must fight against racism and polarization, learn from each other's struggle and build bridges, not walls.
Now, we Lukemans plan to join the solidarity with Bessemer Amazon workers this Saturday for their National Day of Solidarity because we understand that when all people in society are valued and treated with dignity in whatever job they do, whatever position they hold, whatever role they play, or however they exist in society, society as a whole is better, freer, safer, and we all can thrive. We believe that the fight for labor rights is never just about labor rights. It is truly about improving society as a whole. And I think the Paris Commune, which was established on March 18, 1871, is actually a good example of that. Now, the Paris Commune was a popular-led democratic government that was inspired by the Marxist politics and revolutionary goals of the International Working Men's Organization, also known as the First International, where the workers of Paris united and overthrew the capitalist regime of post-Franco-Prussian War Paris to establish a democratically elected government rather than continue to live under the Parisian monarchy. So anti-monarchy forces seized the government's buildings with the support of the National Guard and set up a democratically run government for two months that dismantled the economic inequalities and power hierarchies that were rife in French monarchical society. And they did this by canceling interest on debt, allowing workers to take over abandoned factories. They prohibited employers from firing employees as a disciplinary measure. They removed religious instruction from public schooling. They transferred church property from private ownership to public for all to use. They abolished the police and more. The communards, that's what they called themselves, barricaded themselves in the capital city and turned the public space of Paris into property for the people to be used by the people to serve the needs of the people. And they created a thriving communal living space, a commune. But the French army, representing the society's elite and what would eventually become the Third Republic, the paramilitary government that emerged after the Franco-Prussian War that was opposed to the working class-led socialist reforms, eventually retook Paris in a ruthless and bloody siege in which tens of thousands of mostly working class Parisians, including women and children, were slaughtered and imprisoned. But the socialist goals of the commune, as well as the tactic of using public urban space as the centrality of protest and organization, have lived on. And we can see this in the early labor struggles in the U.S., where striking workers developed tent encampments at the site of strikes to live and organize together. In the Bonus Army March on Washington and the tent encampment they erected in 1932, in the original Poor People's Campaign's Resurrection City in 1968 to Occupy Wall Street in 2011 to the autonomous zones established in the recent National Black Lives Matter protests during the summer of 2020, and even to housing activists taking over abandoned properties for homeless families to push for better housing policies. We might call them new names today, but the tactics of appropriating public property to establish a communal environment as a method of organizing and protest is almost as old as the struggle for working class dignity itself. And it is a struggle we can never afford to give up on until we win. And we will. Follow Luke Mon Nation on patreon.com slash Nation for lots of great content.